Hello, brilliant entrepreneur. It's Tash Corbin here, and welcome to another episode of the Heart Centered Business Podcast. This is episode number 346, which means you can find all the relevant links and show notes for today's episode over at tashcorbin.com forward slash 346. In today's episode, I'm going to share with you how to attract premium clients. So if you have been feeling like the type of people you are attracting into your business aren't a fit or they aren't necessarily at the appropriate level for your work, they aren't necessarily ready to invest at the level that you are looking for, then this is going to be a really helpful episode for you. And I also also just quickly want to say that my advice is probably not going to be what you expect. It's not going to be those standard things that most mentors use in order to attract better in inverted commas clients. And instead I'm going to challenge you to actually be a premium provider. So tread carefully on this one. It is not going to be those superficial strategies. Let's dive on in. I'm Tash Corbin and this is the Heart Centered Business Podcast. Very often in my role as a business mentor and a marketing strategist, I have people ask me a question about attracting a better caliber of clients. And this is actually a really good indicator for me that someone has some sales baggage. And whilst there absolutely are some strategies that we can use in order for you to attract better and more premium clients, I also just want to straight up say that no one person is more valuable than another. No one client is better than another. And in a lot of cases, the attract premium clients is actually, I don't want to have to do the sales stuff in disguise. So people will use the reason, oh, well, I'm just not attracting the right quality or caliber of audience as a reason why they're not making the money that they want to make. But actually it's not your audience's fault. And it's never your potential client's fault that they don't necessarily jump in straight away to work with you or they don't necessarily see the value the way that you see the value of your services or your products. And so I want to be 100% straight up with you and invite you to reflect on if this is one of your desires, why? Why do you want to attract a better caliber of person? Because I am such an, you know, such a we're all equal kind of person. I am someone who doesn't see a lot of um, relationships as hierarchical. And so I am often drawn to this question of, well, what makes one person better than another or more premium than another? So the first question to ask, if you are someone who is wishing, oh, I just had, wish I had a better caliber of client. The first question to ask is why? What are actually the signs that are telling you there's something wrong? What is it at the micro level that is making you feel like something is amiss? Because in most cases, those individual signs need to be addressed at the micro level first. So yes, I'm going to share with you some strategies to really up level the um, readiness and the uh, investment capability of people coming into your business. But first and foremost, I want us to address some of the micro level things. Number one, are you trying to avoid having to sell? For a lot of people, they simply believe if I attract someone who has lots of money, I won't have to convince them to work with me. If I just attract someone who's hungry to invest and hungry to get the results, I won't have to sell so hard. And that's actually trying to outsource or avoid the sales and marketing process. And the sales and marketing process as a business owner is unavoidable. So it's a fruitless task. It's a thankless endeavor um, to just simply say that the quality of the people you're attracting is the problem. 
Because the longer you blame your audience, the longer you'll continue to try and convince yourself that you don't have to do any sales and marketing. And actually it's just their fault that they don't understand. So you need to get in front of different people. And the longer you'll spend chasing around the internet, looking for those somehow magically better people. And in most cases, the audience that you have is actually the most likely audience to invest with you, the most likely to invest the most money with you. What needs to change is you. What needs to change is your sales approach, your marketing approach, and even just your uh, proactiveness in terms of sales and marketing. Some other examples of micro level changes that need to happen. So one of the reasons some people say, I just need to attract a better caliber of client is that um, they're getting a lot of pricing objections. So a lot of people on sales calls or in email conversations are saying, yeah, I, I just can't afford it or that's out of my budget right now. And so they think that if they find people who have more uh, disposable income, then that will magically change that issue and solve it for, for them. But in most cases, if you're getting a lot of pricing objections, the problem's not the price, the problem is the value. So people are willing to invest and pay those premium prices if they see the value of what it is that you have to offer. And if you can connect that value to what is important for them, that's where this whole shirking your marketing responsibilities part comes in. It's not as simple as just saying, well, I'll just attract people with a high disposable income. That's why a lot of people, when we do some work on niching, they'll say, oh, I wanna work with successful women, or I wanna work with um, you know, high flying corporate women who love luxury. The reason why they're saying that as part of their niching is that they have a perception that those people will have more money and therefore will be more likely to part with that money without having to go through a lot of that sales process, a lot of that marketing. But that's actually not the case. I, in my experience, wealthy people are just as discerning about how they invest their money as people who are, you know, have the tighter budgets. They are just, just as equally discerning with their spending and they equally need to see that what they're getting in return for their spend is going to create a valuable return on their investment. It's connected to what their priorities are. And so if you're getting lots of pricing objections, in most cases, it's not your audience, it's the value proposition of what it is that you're selling. Similarly, if people are dragging their feet and they're not buying with urgency, they're taking a long time to make decisions, then that is an issue of desire and priorities. It's not an issue of the person. It's the fact that the priority or the desire that you are addressing with your product or service is not a match or to their priorities or you haven't adequately linked it to their priorities. So if you can't um, demonstrate how working with you will help people achieve their goals, then you're gonna have trouble getting them to commit quickly. You're gonna have trouble getting them to make a decision because your product or service still seems to be a nice to have for them, but they have other priorities that need to come first. And in most cases, we cannot change someone's priority. If someone doesn't prioritize their health, you will not change those priorities. Our natural priorities are just what they are. But if you can link the work that you are doing to what is their top priority or one of their top priorities, then you're gonna be far more likely to create that increased desire and that increased urgency. So again, that's not an audience issue. It's actually you connecting the work that you do with the desires and priorities of your audience, not them just magically changing their mind or shifting their life priorities overnight. Um, and then another reason why people say I need a better quality client or I need to attract more premium clients is that the people they're working with aren't necessarily doing the work. So they're in resistance mode or they keep delaying their sessions or they're not doing their homework from their sessions. Um, and that actually is a matter of addressing resistance. So if in your work you are not paying attention to the resistance that comes up for your clients, if you are not addressing that resistance or ensuring that you um, at least equip them with the uh, ability to notice that resistance and overcome it, then maybe you're only doing half the job. That's not your 
client's fault that they've create they've dived into this big old resistance piece that's part of the work so that's why even though i am very clear that i'm not a mindset specialist in all of my programs in all of my vip work we talk about mindset and if at any point there's like a big mindset block that's come up and it's something that's beyond the scope of my work I will recommend to my client that they do work with a mindset practitioner or that they do dedicate consistent time and space to their mindset work because it will significantly improve the results that they get from our work together. But we need to take shared responsibility with our clients for paying attention to not only the specific um, areas that you're focused on, you're working on, but also paying attention to what resistance will come up for them. And being a great mentor or a great coach or a great healer or a great trainer or a great graphic designer or a great web developer or a great copywriter actually involves treating humans as humans and understanding that we can get caught up in resistance and having strategies to notice when the, that resistance happens, address that resistance and equip your clients with the information, the skills, the knowledge that they need in order to either address that on their own or with another practitioner or address that in their work with you as well. So they are some of those sort of micro level signs that maybe you want to attract a more premium client. But in all cases, the problem's not the audience. The problem's not the client. There is something in the relation to your marketing and sales approach or your delivery approach that isn't quite addressing the whole picture and that needs to be addressed. So the longer you keep telling yourself the problem is the audience or the problem is the quality of my clients, the longer you will avoid and resist looking at what's really causing these challenges for you and therefore the longer the problem will continue to uh, proliferate in your business. So um, I always invite you to ask that question. Why do I think I need better quality clients here? Why do I think I need to attract more of a premium audience here? And are there some micro level things that I can actually address with my sales and marketing strategies or with my delivery approach that will address those things? And therefore the problem's not them. It's just, we need to address those things. Now, all of that being said, there are some strategies that you can use to attract a more premium audience to your business. People who are more ready to invest, people who are more ready to get the work done, people who are have a more urgency around purchasing from you. Now, there are some strategies that are very superficial and there are some that are actually more at the depth that's going to create a long term sustainable change. So let's look at some of those superficial um, strategies first, because the superficial strategies do often work, but sometimes they work only for a short period of time. So I want to address those as well, because I do think that they make some difference. But I also want us to dive a little deeper. So the four more um uh, superficial ways that we can attract more of a premium audience is first and foremost, increase your prices. Now, I always say this with a caveat because I have seen far too many people in the past just go from charging $1,500 for their VIP package to now my VIP package is $5,000 and they get no clients or worse, they get one client at the $5,000 price and then they feel like they can't put the price back down because someone's already paid $5,000, but everything dries up and they create this feast and famine cycle for themselves. You know, I've worked with people before, they've come to me after nine months of no clients because they previously had worked with a mentor who said, oh, $1,500 is too cheap, your price should be $10,000. And so they took that mentor's advice, they put their package price up to $10,000, they made a sale, so of course they went shouting from the rooftops, this mentor is incredible, this strategy actually works, oh my gosh, my life has changed. And then nine months, not another single client. So whilst in the short term that strategy worked well because it did get someone in at a premium price, long term it wasn't sustainable because the other pieces that go with being a $10,000 provider weren't actually addressed. You can't just increase your prices and keep providing uh, an inferior service or keep speaking to low level outcomes and expect 
to attract, magically attract an audience who just go, oh, okay, $10,000 is fine with me. So whilst increasing your prices does work to attract a different um, sub niche in the market, it isn't necessarily sustainable if that's the only strategy that you use. So I do have a podcast episode about how to increase your prices and I use an incremental price increase strategy to take my audience with me. So I'll make sure that I link to that in the show notes of today's episode at tashcorbin.com forward slash 346. And I actually have quite a few podcast episodes that speak to some of these strategies. So wherever I do, I'll make sure that I link to those podcast episodes for you so that you can get that full picture and some of the more practical step-by-step strategies on how you implement that. Number two is your branding. So there's absolutely a case for being a premium brand. And so if your website looks homemade, if your uh, handouts and your videos look very homemade, that can contribute to a perception that you are not a premium provider. If you uh, aren't consistent with your brand, that can, and that you've got a very clunky brand, that can contribute to a perception that you're not a premium in the market. And so, um, you know, there are ways to use branding, not just visual branding, but also your brand voice and the type of messaging that you use to attract people who are, you know, in that market for a premium provider. But I would also say that this is superficial because if it's just all gloss, but there's nothing to back it up or substantiate it behind the scenes, then again, it's not going to be sustainable. If people start to see the cracks and they start to see that in essence, it's just, you know, you've shined up the surface of your business, but the provision behind the scenes or the services behind the scenes aren't, don't match that brand, then again, it's not going to be sustainable. So that's why I say both pricing and branding are more at the superficial level because we need to back it up. Number three is testimonials. So sharing client success stories, sharing people's experience of working with you can also present you as a premium provider. Now, um, I call this one a superficial strategy because we know these days testimonials can be bought Testimonials can be faked. Um, Testimonials only account for about 2% of the buying decision, but when used with other strategies as part of a more fulsome sales and marketing approach, testimonials about the client experience in particular um, can be very helpful with presenting you as a premium in the market. And then the fourth way is to niche down to people who are more in that, um, you know, more disposable income or who are more readily investing and doing the work. But here's the thing. I put this in the category of superficial because it's not enough to just go on the internet and say, I work with successful people. I mean, if those people are so successful, what do they need you for? And Um, You know, saying that you work with women who love luxury doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to attract someone who's ready to invest in your work. As I said before, it's not just about price. It's also about the perceived value of working with you. So, you know, if someone loves purchasing Louboutin shoes and, you know, high quality tailored garments, just because you say your $5 sarongs are for luxury buyers doesn't necessarily mean that we believe you. So when it comes to niche as a way of attracting premium buyers, it's not a matter of telling the internet what your niche is or telling the internet that you only work with coachable people or people willing to do the work. You know who perceives themselves as willing to do the work? people who are not at all willing to do the work. The people who come to me and say, I'm so coachable, Tash. I'm so ready to do the work. In my experience, they are the people most likely to get into resistance. They are the people most likely to be white knuckling their way through this 
trying, they're just saying it over and over in their head, trying to convince themselves that they are ready to commit when in S in real essence, they are not, they are the least likely to be ready to commit. So it's not as simple as just telling the internet what your niche is. It's having a brand, a message, a value proposition, a delivery methodology, a customer service experience that matches that niche. So just telling people that your niche is people who have a high disposable income does not necessarily attract people with a high disposable income. It's a much more complex marketing approach in order to be able to do that. So they are the four more superficial strategies. Increase your price, have a premium brand, use lots of testimonials that give um, a, an image of a premium experience and selecting a niche that's going to have more disposable income or be more aligned to what you perceive as a premium. But here's the big stuff. If you want to attract premium clients, number one, you need to deliver premium outcomes, period. If you deliver substandard outcomes, if you have a substandard service, if your products feel cheap, look cheap, are cheap, then you're going to struggle to attract premium buyers. So you need to be confident in your ability to deliver premium outcomes. You need to create not just a premium customer service experience, but premium results. You need to have that confidence, that real deep belief that the transformation you facilitate with your products and services is a premium transformation. And that's bigger than just putting a glossy brand on things, right? So this is why these are not the superficial things. These are the things that make the biggest difference, but they take the most complex strategy to be able to do that. They take time. They take experience to be able to do those things. They take a commitment and dedication to being a premium provider. So number one, deliver premium outcomes. Number two, articulate your value proposition effectively by taking responsibility for sales and marketing. Learn how to create copy and messaging that actually articulates a premium outcome, that actually articulates what you do aligned with the priorities of your ideal clients. That's really critical. And for most people, articulating their value proposition is where they let themselves down with their sales and marketing strategy. They have all of the tactics they know to be on Instagram and doing reels. They know to have a mailing list. They know to have freebies. They know to run webinars, right? They've got all of this, the tactics down, but in every place where they show up, their messaging is flimsy at best. Their messaging is vague. Their value proposition is unclear. They don't know how to tangibly articulate the transformation that they facilitate. And so it looks fuzzy to your audience. And when things look fuzzy and hard to understand and it doesn't resonate, people will resist paying you money and they certainly will resist paying a premium price. So that's number two is get really skilled at articulating your value proposition. And again, I do have a great podcast episode on that. So if you don't know how to articulate your value proposition, that's going to be the podcast episode to check out. I'll make sure we link to it in the show notes. Number three, behave like a premium provider. So if you're constantly apologizing to potential customers because you didn't see their email for four days because you're totally overwhelmed, or if you, um, you know, if you have people uh, constantly needing to reschedule their sessions because you didn't arrange childcare or because your computer keeps breaking down or you don't have fast enough internet, right? All of those things that um, degrade the experience of your potential clients and your actual clients will start detracting from your positioning. You will no longer attract premium clients if you are not a premium provider. And behaving like a premium provider isn't just about the experience that you provide for people. It's also about the energy that you bring to the table. It's about the way that you show up. So if you are undernourished, dehydrated, sleep deprived, running from appointment to appointment, you have no spaciousness in your day, you don't look after yourself, 
that is also going to contribute to people's perception of who you are and whether you're a premium provider or not. You know what it's like to go to a restaurant and the wait staff are run off their feet completely. You get no time with them. You feel like you're inconveniencing them by being there. That doesn't feel like a premium experience compared to going to a luxurious restaurant where you have a dedicated server. They check in on you a couple of times, not too much, right? They're not desperate for your reassurance that everything's okay, but they are attentive. They have time to speak with you and explain the menu. They have time to make wine recommendations. That feels like a premium experience. The exact same can be said for the experience of working with an online provider or working with a massage therapist or working with a yoga teacher. We know what it feels like to have a premium experience. So if you're not behaving like a premium provider, then you will not attract premium clients. So for every time that you say, oh, I'll just skip lunch today, or I'll just grab some takeaway, um, oh, I won't go for a walk today, I'm just going to hustle, 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 you're actually eroding your space as a premium provider. You're eroding our perception that you provide a premium experience. Because if you're rushing from thing to thing, if you don't have time to grab a drink of water and have a toilet break in between clients, then you're going to make us feel like, well, that's going to be what we can get from you, right? Because we don't want what you're having. So that doesn't feel like a premium experience. So how can you behave more like a premium provider? Not just in the service that you provide or in your customer service experience, but also in the way that you look after yourself and the time and space that you have for yourself as well. That's a challenging one. I know it's gonna push a lot of buttons, but it's true. Number four, build your expertise and experience. If you've only built two websites for people in my market before, I'm not gonna perceive you as a premium provider. If you don't know the language of my the business world, I'm not going to think you're a premium business provider. If you ha- don't have the expertise that I would expect from someone who's a leader in the industry, then I'm not going to perceive you as a premium. And so you're going to struggle to attract those premium level clients. Um, sometimes you got to you know, do, do the, the work. You've got to work with the clients. And that's why I love the incremental price increase strategy, because as you up level your experience and expertise, you up level your prices. It's a, an appropriate match. And therefore it doesn't create all the mindset wobbles about, Oh, I don't know if I'm good enough for this. It doesn't bring up all your imposter syndrome. You know, your clients cannot hold space for your imposter syndrome. That's not their job. Your clients are not responsible for explaining the ins and outs of your job as a provider. So if you want to be a premium and if you want to attract premium clients, you need to have worked with some people. You need to build your expertise. You need to consistently invest in your personal and professional development. You need to consistently stay on top of industry changes and trends. You need to pay attention to what's happening in your market and be a voice of authority. And that takes time and presence and experience. So if you feel like maybe that's an area that's not a strength of yours, and so therefore you're not attracting those premium level clients because of it, then just know that it's something that can be changed very quickly over the next few months. It doesn't have to take years and years for you to build that expertise, but it absolutely does take some time. You need to work with the clients you have now and deliver a premium experience for them and deliver really great outcomes for them so that you feel aligned with then stepping up to the next level and stepping up to the next level. And that doesn't have to take years. As I said, it can be a matter of months. From the first month of my business to the sixth month of my business, my confidence in the advice I was providing, my confidence in my expertise, the experience that I could bring to the table for my clients was massively different. I I absolutely skyrocketed my experience and expertise in the first six months of my business. But that's because above everything else, I prioritize getting clients. So I made a commitment to myself at the very beginning of my business that regardless of what they paid me, 
I would work with five new people every single week because I knew that one of the keys to me having a sustainably growing business and a business that was a premium in the market was to have the experience of working with clients. And so initially I didn't charge a premium price for people to work with me. I just got the quantity of people working with me, but I delivered quality work. I delivered on those outcomes. I got client feedback. I was an avid learner. I invested in my personal and professional development. I went to industry conferences. I bought courses on the types of things that my clients needed the most help with. I bought copywriting courses, web development courses, social media courses, because I knew that those were areas where I needed to improve my skill set for my services to be premium services. And it only took me six months to go from charging $49 for two hours to charging $495 for two hours. So you can see that I 10 x my prices over six months, but I increased my prices slowly with every few clients. So for every five to 10 clients that I worked with, I reviewed my prices. And every couple of weeks, I would look at, okay, do I need to do another little price increase here? And um, if it was a yes, then I'd use that price increase strategy. I was building epic experience. I was building my expertise. And that takes taking on the clients. That takes working with people. That takes personal and professional development. And then the fifth deep way that you can attract more premium clients is to be your unique self. Do not commodify yourself. So if you provide five page websites, just like every other web developer out there, people will then buy based on price. If you provide yoga classes online, just like every other online yoga class provider out there, and there's nothing unique about what it is that you're delivering, people will buy the cheapest. You commodify yourself when you try and look like everyone else in your market. Now, this is usually the opposite of what people think that they need to do. The first thing that people do when they enter a market is go and look at what everyone else is doing so that they can um, emulate that, so that they can learn from that, so that they can replicate that in their own services, in their own copy, in their own website. But that is the fastest way to put yourself in a commodity market. So, and a commodity market is price driven. So if you're looking to attract high quality premium clients who pay premium prices, the last thing you wanna do is look like a commodity in your market. Look like the only differentiator between you and your competitors is your price. Because then if that's the only difference, people will choose the most affordable price. So rather than looking to blend into your market or to emulate what other people are doing in your market. Instead, look for ways to differentiate yourself in your market. Um, there's a brilliant book, Blue Ocean Strategy. That's a great way to start thinking about how you might present yourself differently. Um, there are also you know, some great um, uh, providers out there who help with understanding your own unique voice and what it is that you bring to the table. But ultimately, one of the fastest ways to bring your unique approach forward is to tune out the competitors in your market, stop looking at what everyone else is doing, and instead invest some time in developing your unique brand voice, your unique service provision, your unique delivery methodologies, right? Rather than borrowing from everyone else in your market and then making slight tweaks to make it feel like it's your own, instead actually develop some intellectual property, actually develop some differentiated delivery methods, actually de develop clear value proposition that doesn't look like you're exactly providing the exact same thing as other people in your market because that's commodifying yourself. So if someone is, uh, you know, commodity might be sugar, right? Sugar is sugar and sugar in most cases. So if you're just selling sugar, then people will just look for the cheapest sugar. But if you're selling organically grown raw sugar that's beautifully packed into cubes specifically for your cup of tea or coffee, 
then all of a sudden, I'm not looking at what is the price per gram compared to the price per gram of another bag of sugar, right? I'm looking at, oh, this looks really fancy. This looks really unique. Um, is the value that I'm going to get from that product perceived as appropriate for the price that you're charging? And if it's a price I'm willing to pay, I buy the thing. So you can see that even a commodity like sugar can be differentiated so that it is no longer commodified. And it's exactly the same for online providers, um, for service-based businesses, for personal brands, for influencers, uh, for all entrepreneurial pursuits, really. And so asking that question of how can I present myself as a unique provider uh, is very effective in then attracting premium clients. Now, one of the most effective ways of being unique in your market, of having that unique messaging and for staying away from being a commodity is to get very, very specific and tangible with your niching. So if you niche right down to be a specialist for a particular niche, you will then stand out as a specialist expert and you obliterate the competition out of the question, right? So if, let's say, I have a hairdressing salon and I find two interior decorators. One is a generic interior decorator and it's $1,000 for a consult. And one is a specialist hairdresser interior designer who specializes in helping you attract the exact right clients and providing a unique customer service experience and getting lots and lots of repeat custom through powerfully curated interior design. And their consult fee is $5,000. If I have a hair salon, which one am I most likely to see as the most valuable to me? Which one am I most likely to buy? Even though the specialist is five times the price, because they've been able to articulate not just who they're for, but why that is important and powerful and valuable for someone in that niche, then all of a sudden, it's not. I'm not comparing based on price. I'm comparing based on value, on outcomes, based on specialization, expertise. And that expertise comes from just being specific about the problem that you solve and for whom you solve it. So niching isn't about saying, I am a such and such practitioner, right? Your, your modality is not your niche. Your, um, your messaging is not your niche. Your niche is the decisions that you make behind the scenes about who you're gonna focus on with your marketing. And so if that has raised something for you around, oh, I don't know if I actually know what my niche is or I don't know if my niche is specific enough to really pitch me as a premium provider, then with the show notes of today's episode, make sure you come and check out my Nail Your Niche training. It's absolutely free and uh, it's about an hour long and it goes through what are the five most important niching decisions that you need to make and how do you translate the decisions behind the scenes around what niche you're focused on into resonant messaging for that niche. Because your niche is not your message. You don't just go onto the internet and say, I work with ambitious women who have two children and love yoga and I help them with feng shui, right? You don't just tell your niche who they are. You create value-based messaging and a clear value proposition for that niche. That's what you share. You share your message and your value proposition. And when you create your message and your value pro proposition through the lens of knowing exactly who the niche is that you're creating it for, it's far more resonant, resonant it's far more effective, and it pitches you as a premium provider. So make sure you come over and check out the show notes at tashcorbin.com forward slash 346 because that nail your niche training is very practical and can help you pitch yourself as a premium simply by making important niching decisions. All right, that's it for today's episode of the Heart Center Business Podcast. As you can see, this was a really juicy one, but I think it's important for us to really have the full conversation because it's not just as simple as charging more. Despite what some marketing gurus out there will tell you, that is not the full story of how you present yourself as a premium. And, um, you know, I think for a lot of people, there are micro issues that you can address and that will resolve a lot of the challenges that tell you you don't have a premium market. 
market um, before you even need to make any other significant changes to your marketing strategy or your sales approach. So thank you so much for sticking with me for this episode. If you've got any follow-up questions to this one, just slide on into my DMs on Instagram or Facebook. I'll put the links to that with the show notes of today's episode as well, because I understand that this can sometimes raise some issues, push some buttons. Um, It can also prompt other questions. So feel free to get in touch. You can also send an email through to support at tashcorbin.com at any time with any follow-up questions. And I'm happy to uh, provide any further advice that I can or answer your questions. Thank you so much for joining me. Until next time, I cannot wait to see you shine. Bye for now. Would you like more tips, tools, and resources to help you grow your heart-centered business? Head to tashcorbin.com today.